I don't know if people can quite hear us yet. Um, we were complaining about broadband in rural America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it was on our end or not, but we seem to have a disconnection. I swear it wasn't to underscore the point that you can't <laughs> conduct education with our terrible internet. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe we give folks because folks are getting logged back. Let's give them a Let's few them minutes uh, to get back on. So there was so, some air yeah. that just kicked everyone off. Yeah. So. I just I kept on getting like an air one one zero three three or something. Yeah. So I see we, we've got about thirty percent participants on now we were up to about 60 so let's just give folks a couple more minutes to log back in um jeff do you remember where you were where uh yeah yeah i'll uh if you uh enable sharing internet issues <laughs> Makes for a good story. <laughs> it hits home the point, yeah. Imagine oh, being it does. a first grader doing this, yeah. Okay. Now, and while we're giving people a chance to join, I'll even tell they even tried to do a workaround where they sent home tablets that were preloaded with stuff so you wouldn't need internet. But they, uh, the people who devised that strategy didn't understand you needed um, cell phone data to do the tablets. And if you get about five minutes away from our home, you could drive an hour before you'd have cell phone service at all, let alone um, data. So that also wasn't able to be used as a workaround. So a lot of times, even what people think of as a low tech approaches to still deliver instructional technology don't necessarily work without internet because they're also, we're also lacking the cell phone data and cell phone broadband as well. I don't know if you'll get to this in your presentation, but I'm curious to, as to any creative uh, solutions that have come up besides just the paper packets for your student, for your you know first grader. But as those, those, those are like some pretty significant challenges to overcome. You know? Yeah, and at some point we've got to decide is the workaround right or do we have to just make a huge investment in broadband infrastructure and figure out how to make that happen? Like we have historically made investments in telephone or electricity even where, you know, it took a long time to get electricity to rural farms and stuff. A lot of places didn't fully have um, electricity in, into the 50s. So it kind of took acts of Congress in the past to make sure that those types of infrastructure were in place. And we might just be at a crossroads where some of that is, we need to realize that that's an important piece of equality and make it a policy issue at the federal level. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, it looks like we've got the closed captioning up and running again, and most folks have been able to join back on. So I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff and Sky, to pick up where we left off. Great, yeah, I think uh, we were talking about uh, COVID and uh, connection to the natural world and food ways, and um, that being uh, another strength of rural communities. Uh, and I think I was telling this story about whether someone asked whether we regretted uh, moving here, um, which, you know, is a fair question, um, you know, especially if you read, you know, a lot of popular press, you know, where we live is often ranked as one of the worst places to live in America. Um, and, you know, there there's these hidden strengths, I think, in rural communities, uh, and these are a lot of them, that really don't come out. And in the book, we have two chapters, one's called From the Outside Looking In, that lays out a lot of the challenges, how we began our presentation. And then the next one, we in that very next chapter, it's From the Inside Looking In. And it's the lived experience um, that draws people back to rural communities uh, that makes them want to live and, and raise their families and send their kids to schools in rural communities. 
And these are some of the big buckets of, of strengths-based uh, research that shows why living in a rural community might be better generally for children. Um, but if you live in a rural community, if you grew up in a rural community, sometimes it's really hard to put your finger on that feeling. And, um, and you just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more, uh, it's almost more spiritual in many ways, uh, for rural folks. And I know, you know, we might be treading across a line here, but that's really what in many ways draws, us, drew us here to Eastern Kentucky. And then just to find that there's this research out there that actually supports, um, all these great strengths of, uh, raising your kids and in a rural community and having them go to school there. Um, so one big issue that comes up over and over again that we do want to address um, is complexifying this idea of the brain drain. And we have to give, there's a lot of people uh, in the participant list that we saw and we hello to all of our mentors, uh, faculty, uh, people we've worked with at Harvard, we got to single out uh, Cole Rains if he's if he rejoined us. He's a senior right now at Harvard College, and he grew up just down the road here in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and he, we highlight, we don't name him because you know we didn't want to embarrass him too much. But he's on page <laughs> one thirty four of the book, um, and he is a person. He he's uh, interned um, with me the last two summers, um, and he's going to come back to Eastern Kentucky. Um, and he's going to do some, he's already done some impactful work. And, you know, I think we focus so much on the, 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 sm the smart kids leaving town, but, you know, let's take a little bit of a deeper look. First of all, um, most adults never leave their home state. And met a lot of adults, 37%, never have lived outside their hometown if you take away military and college. In urban and suburban areas, we, of course, encourage kids to go and reach for that best school. Harvard has kids from all over the world and the United States, and people are proud of those kids going there, whether they're from urban, suburban, or rural. But somehow, if a rural kid goes, then it's brain drain. It's not brain drain if, if an urban or suburban kid leaves. Um, but And the fact is, is because they don't talk about that boomerang effect when that kid comes back. Um, so we, you know, you just have to think about how we force um, rural communities to say, well, you need, you have to leave uh, your community if you want to have a good life. Um, and then the other issue is, is that the vast majority of students attend a college or universities within 50 miles of where they grew up. And why is that a problem? Well, rural communities are pretty much higher education deserts. They cover 97% of the United States, but they only host about 14% of the nation's colleges and universities. And just one example here in Kentucky, um, Eastern Kentucky University is actually a four, three or four hour drive from many parts of Eastern Kentucky. Um, and that's the, the closest major uh, state higher education institution. Same thing if you look in Montana and Minnesota and New Mexico and Alaska and a lot of different places, they have a few major state universities that are hundreds of miles away from the rural students and rural communities. And a piece of this too, you know, and just complexifying our understanding of things is when we talk about brain drain, we're certainly saying that certain jobs require a brain, perhaps more than others. And as we realize that we have this, we don't have enough people in skilled trades and other kinds of professions. It'll probably help to stop thinking about certain kinds of professions as the ones that we're shooting for or that require brain. The other thing is there's a huge reason why a lot of people live close to their home, no matter whether they're urban, suburban or rural is because of childcare, because it's so unaffordable. And rural communities have some of the least access to uh, any form of early child care, any kind of education, including Head Start and Early Head Start has been important. The federal program has been important in bringing that just all kinds of complex issues and where people live and why. Um, and we just want to touch on a, on a couple of things here. Um, th these are some of the major forces that are shaping rural communities today. 
and, and really economic vitality. And that is both, you know, decline and, and significant increase. You know, you saw in, we, we touch upon some issues when a new uh, meat processing plant opens up in Iowa and an influx of uh, immigrants from, who don't speak English come, how does that, how does the rural school system absorb that? Then what happens when um, immigration comes in and arrests you know, a vast number? This happened in Iowa about 10 years ago, um, one of the largest mass arrests and deportations that had ever occurred in the history. Um, of immigration customs enforcement and how that impacted this small rural Iowa community. Um, North Dakota uh, oil shale, same thing, the boom, the bust, the boom, the bust. How does that affect both the economic vitality, the population stability? How do these actually impact the day-to-day -day experiences of rural educators? And then finally, the leadership capacity in rural communities, it's not about, uh, organizations or institutions partnering with each other. It's about individuals partnering with each other. It's an individually led collaboration. They're not, and, and when there's not a competent leader and in, in the head of a certain organization, people figure out how, and, and how this works other places, but they work around that person. And sometimes they even end up propping up new similar organizations as workarounds to avoid some leader that is perhaps not doing as good as they could. Well, and just another piece of that, we closed the book with some policy recommendations. And one of the pitfalls in dealing with rural America is to say, well, you know, they don't necessarily have the universities there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take people from outside of the region and we're going to bring them in briefly. They're just gonna sort of come in for a day or a few hours so that they can provide their expertise. If you don't build leadership amongst the population that's there, it's not necessarily leading to support something that's sustainable. So where you see um, effective programs take place in rural America is where people make a significant investment in the people on the ground. You know, realistically, our empirical knowledge base about rural children is very limited. It's especially limited for certain special populations. You know. Um, migrant children, children who speak languages other than English, children with disabilities in rural communities. These are, these are children we don't necessarily know a lot about, but that knowledge base is there. It's just within the communities themselves. And if we don't work and find ways to tap on that knowledge and build from there, we're unlikely to make the kind of sustainable change <clears throat> that's going to improve equality in America. And, you know, that's, you know, for us living and working here, and then we're uh, open it up questions. to questions. You know that that is you know one of the more frustrating things we we see is you know it, it's helpful to to be well armed with Harvard degrees, um, but it's also really really frustrating to see money that gets funneled through major institutions that are hours away from where we live, and trickle down into you know technical assistance from someone driving their car in and trying to you know tell people what to do when they already actually know how to do it. And we have great stories in the book, especially at the end of the book, about how uh, we experience that our own children have experienced, you know, grand announcements of multi-million dollar grants that are going to help their school. And then, you know, we're like, where, what, what's going on? And, you know, and you start to dig and it makes people feel uncomfortable because the answer is, is that the money ends up in, uh, you know, a, a different institution supporting salaried people um, and not actually making its way into the school. Um, now, certainly that's not the case with everything. You know, there's some really powerful work going on with like Save, for, Save the Children and some other national uh, organizations like that, but it, it is a mix. So with that, um, we, we can just open it up to questions. Um, and I see we've got a few here, but maybe. Uh, She's going to tell us. Oh, you're, the question, okay. Right? Laura's going to tell us questions. Great. Yeah, just to kind of help you manage. Thank you. Um, thank you both for a really interesting presentation and for your grace under the technical difficulty. We're used to it. Well, we the thought we for sure. Stuff. We thought, well, no, there it goes out again. But we're gonna. We're glad that it was Zoom's fault this time. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of great questions in the Q and A, and I have a few. Uh, of my own as well. So uh, just start with these. Um, 
with the push, you, you touched on this a little bit, but the, with the push to make internet access as a utility, you know, like water, gas, electricity, to what extent do you think this will help rural educators, rural learners, well, students and teachers? I mean, it's, it's critical. <laughs> it's a national emergency. Like it needs to, it should have happened 10 years ago. And it, it will not only help rural educators and teachers and the entire community, but it'll also help the economy. Now, there's some great stories of places that have done it, um, but you know they've been trying to put broadband in Eastern Kentucky for 15 years now. And I just don't understand why it doesn't happen. Sure. Um, you talked about the schools as being centers for rural communities, um, but could you talk a little bit about the role, um, access and success of public libraries as a complement to schools? You know, libraries are a very interesting component of all this. And obviously one of the big, just from a liter literacy perspective, just pure access to books has been shown to be something that helps children, you know, do better in school because the language that is in books isn't necessarily the depth of language or complexity that are in everyday conversations. And when you can't easily go to a fishing pier, but you can read about one in a book, it's a really great way to expand children's knowledge base. You know, we live in a place where bookmobiles are common, but the reality is, is that most um, things like public libraries are supported by a local tax base. And, you know, when you live in an area like we do, where, you know, you're one of the 14 poorest median income counties in America, the reality is, is that the tax base just isn't there. So it comes back to these unequal funding that we, we didn't really talk about too much, but even take something like Title I funds. Title I funds are distributed at the state level and typically the formula that's used doesn't look at proportion of children in poverty, but number. So those, those funds almost always go to urban centers and not out to the more outlying parts of a state where there might be a lot of children, like here in Appalachia, we have a lot of children living in poverty, but we still don't get the same amount of Title I funds. And then when you look at philanthropy, uh, what is it? For every $400 spent on philanthropy in Appalachia, there's $4,000 spent in San Francisco. So yeah, you know, you can look at somebody like Dolly Parton started up the Imagination Library and just mailing books to children has been wonderful. We've participated in that program. You know, we love Dolly Parton. That's great. But fundamentally, as long as we don't see rural communities as important and we don't put resources towards them, it's not going to take place at the level we need to do where we're going to see greater access to life opportunities through something like enhanced literacy. It's just that the dose is too little. Okay, great. This question kind of builds upon that, what you were just saying there too. Um, uh, the, the participant is asking, for, from my experience, rural and urban communities have a number of similar challenges, but different populations. What do you think of both communities collaborating for mutual benefits and funding? Yes, <laughs> let's organize. Um, it's yeah, absolutely. We say, you know, we say that all the time. You know, we lived in Boston. We've lived all, all different places. What people want in urban areas, what families want is the same thing that people want in rural communities. The 90% the of people who voted in Cambridge for Hillary Clinton and the 90% of people who voted for Donald Trump in Harlan County, they want the same things. They want good schools. They want affordable health care. They want safe communities. You know, and the thing is, is that I, it, not to get political, but I already did. Um, so who cares at this point? But the, <laughs> the polarization is out of hand and it has created a divide in this country that has roadblocked and stopped real consensus building collaboration and policies that actually are just common sense that would work. And until we have um, politicians who, who have the political will to stand up and for a good idea and not their own political party, things are just gonna continue to be the same. But we certainly have organized and brought people to Louisville and Louisville to uh, Eastern Kentucky. And we've hosted many people um, from other places. Um, shout out to Nicole Simon um, for coming down and visiting us. You know, so it needs to happen. And, and, and we've gotten into this conversation a lot. Please come, come and visit us. Um, it's, not, it's not a scary place. It's fun. Uh, there's a good coffee place. We can have a good restaurant. You know, we've got internet for the most part. Um, so we, opening that door, I think, and welp welcoming, 
You know, and it's, it's funny, we joke about it all the time. People in rural communities are afraid to go to urban communities and urban, <laughs> people in urban communities are afraid to go to rural communities. So let's try to break that down a little bit. We do need to do the bridge building. And I mean, <laughs> fundamentally, we do need to have more nuance and uh, in our understanding of poverty and how it affects children and their life trajectories and their education. You know, it doesn't really make sense that we treat it as this monolithic issue that affects all children equally. I mean, I used to go um, and do these workshops at the New York City Department of Education. And it was always fascinating to me because a lot of the principals who were working with children from diverse language backgrounds were so interested in my research on rural education because they were getting children from rural sending countries here in New York City. And they were like, we don't know anything about what to do with rural children. I was like, it's okay, nobody apparently does. Like we're all working to build this knowledge base, but it helps everybody if, if we have a little bit of a more clear understanding of what might be some of those challenges. And also, you know, just to put this out there, there's so much variability to what is rural. You might take a place like Hillsborough County, Hillsborough County, Florida, and obviously very urban district there, but on the stretches of that county in that one district, there's also very rural places where people are primarily in agriculture. So we aren't necessarily as divided as we think both philosophically. I mean, most of us are working towards a common goal. We need that bridge building, but it will actually help rural uh, urban schools if we understand better what's going on with rural schools as well. Okay, right. So staying along that theme of collaboration, um, there's a question in here about partnerships um, and philanthropy. So um, what are some examples you would like to see of respectful and meaningful partnerships with philanthropy? You know, grants and investments from private foundations and governments. Um, yeah, so I, I can speak directly to that. Um, there's a foundation here called the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, and it's a community foundation that's regional. And um, they just started eight years ago or maybe seven years ago. And before that, there was all of the philanthropic dollars would go to uh, foundations and philanthropies based in Lexington or Louisville, um, or, or even you know New York or, or Boston or other places. With that foundation in place, we've been able to take dollars from larger foundations and other high net wealth individuals and get it directly on the ground to the people doing the work. So uh, with that foundation, I mean, they've funded tens of thousands of scholarships for students. You know, when COVID hit, there was relief. We just had absolutely devastating floods here in Eastern Kentucky about three weeks ago. And I was just on a call this morning, um, you know, on a grant committee because an entire downtown was under four feet of water and it destroyed every single business, every single office, every single apartment and house. Um, hundreds and, or, and thousands of people were displaced. And of course, you probably didn't read about it or anything in the news, um, but that, that is an incredible disruption. But we were able to get, raise over a million dollars and distribute that money directly to those people without uh, just straight up grants, straight up just cash to those people who are suffering right now. So those are examples um, that we need to see more of is having that capital um, and locally based community foundations, getting that capital and setting up committees of people who know the people who've been devastating and say, yeah, I can vouch for that person. They lost their whole home. They're, they're living in a motel right now. They need 500 bucks right now. And so I think more of that locally based kinds of infrastructure and institutions and yeah, bring in the technical assistance, bring in the experts and, and, and send people off to Harvard, you know, to, to learn uh, more, but let's have those organizations be based and hosted in the community itself. I just have to say, this is like our last, the last chapter of the book we wrote is really has five steps that people are thinking from policy or philanthropy about how to make it more useful for rural communities. And we obviously want bridges, we want both, but one really quick and simple thing to look at as a metric is what percentage of the salary, the money is going into the tax base of that local community. So if it's the people that you're employing don't live in those communities, then ultimately you're not doing that leadership development that's located within the community itself. So that's just a really simple metric that you can think of is, is, is following the trail to say, well, where is that money going? Is it inherently part of the leadership development? Are we building on those communities or is it more we're taking an expert 
and they're 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 going to reinvest their tax dollars in their community and they're coming in temporarily that's great but it should be a percentage of it and not the entire piece of it great yeah um okay another question that came in through the q a someone about demographics so curious whether the greater economic and racial integration in schools is actually met with greater acceptance and respect across differences or are there major tensions and issues like bullying, discrimination? Well, and you know, I mean, obviously we don't want to put a rose colored glass. Like obviously there's people who live in rural America who feel ostracized or who feel outcast or who feel like they're not accepted. But, you know, I can see Jeff's chomping at the back, <laughs> you know, but on the other hand, you know, practically speaking, you when there is greater integration and you can't necessarily segregate by community because everyone's so close together it does practically speaking lead to greater integration that comes back to the research that you know i'll let you yeah well so for <laughs> harlan county had, had uh coal camps that were historically african-american and so in harlan county you know it, it, it's honestly one of the least racist places i've ever lived um, and, you know, I don't want to pick on Boston too much, but, you know, the, the institutional racism, I think, that you find in urban areas is sometimes so subtle um, and, and hard to put your finger on um, that, that it really shuts a lot of people out. Um, you know, and in rural communities, yeah, you'll see a Confederate flag if you come down here. Yes, you will. Um, and, you know, many people will take that as a signal that, oh, well, that whole community is racist. Um, but we've experienced, you know, quite the opposite. And I think, you know, research on, on schools that are truly more integrated, which bear proof that kids that go to school there are going to grow up to be less racist and more willing and open-minded. So I don't, I mean, it's, yes, in every school, there's bullying and things like that. And I think for particularly students who, who may be LGBTQ, you know, there's obviously some issues, especially around more traditionally conservative beliefs in rural communities. So we can you cannot just sugarcoat or whitewash that. But uh, in our experience, generally, you know, I think there isn't that degree of tension because you're all kind of in it together. I mean, the, you know, one of the things that we sort of argue is rural communities are often on the forefront of some of the most challenging issues in our country. Like we're talking about flooding, climate change. And rural communities are the ones- Even Black, well, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. There were pro, they, they held protests all over Eastern Kentucky, marches uh, for Black Lives Matter. It's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen is all these white people who I know voted for Trump, you know, standing hand in hand and saying, yeah, Black Lives Matter. And I mean, but part of it too is because people are more integrated, you see these discussions, you know, a lot of us live in a political bubble where we don't necessarily interact with people of different political beliefs. Let me tell you, our child got into some discussions about our 10 year old about Black Lives Matter with some of his peers or around the presidential election. And when you see some of these discussions taking place, you're like, this is a model for America where people can come together and they can really discuss it. They know they're going to be together for a long time. They can't write each other off or say, I hate you or I cancel you. They, they like work through it and talk about it. So not that, that it's solved, but I think definitely one of the things you see here is a greater openness to discussing it for people to change their beliefs, to change their minds. And whatever sort of like caricature people have of a lot of rural America that it's white, that it's all conservative, it's, the reality is, is just like any place else, there's all kinds of people with all kinds of different beliefs and we're just kind of a little bit more mashed together. Great. That's really helpful. I think this is a, a great question for us to um, close out the chat with, the discussion with, because um, it kind of speaks to the, the action and next steps. So, you know, beyond money, money before, beyond sending funds, what can we do as college access practitioners oh. to support low income first generation college students to access higher education? Like, where do we begin? Where do we begin to help those students? We touch on this in the book and give an example of a college recruiter, you know, traveling all over the state of Utah, hundreds and hundreds of miles to hits 12, 15 different schools. Let's say they're from, you know, a place like Harvard or Yale, you know, how many applicants are they going to be able to pull out, you know, versus the proportion of time that they're spending? So I think what colleges 
need to do is, is honestly make a commitment to dedicate a, a, a proportion, I'd say 20% of just base it off of the population of their recruitment efforts and dollars on recruiting rural students. Um, one of the most underrepresented populations, we were freshman proctors at Harvard for 11 years. And if Tom Dingman's still there, thanks. We had a great time. Um, you know, rural students were pretty much underrepresented. I mean, pretty rare. Yeah, it's pretty rare to, to come across a, a rural student. And we, um, they gave them to us. Yeah, they gave them to us, which we love. <laughs> um, and so I think that that kind of commitment um, and then also you know, continuing to expand uh, online offerings, I think is great because uh, as long as you can get the internet, obviously, but that's a great way, kind of an equalizer for people who are in extremely rural communities that can't, you know, drive or access higher education. One, well, you know, out of school time is such an important piece of, of people too, because, you know, in literacy, there's this idea of a disciplinary identity. And until I have how do I even imagine myself going to this far off school if I don't know anyone who's been to Harvard or whatever, I've never met that person. It's, it's, you want to get a chance to try that identity on or else you'll imagine it's not available to you. It's just very similar with STEM. If you don't know anybody who's a scientist, how could you ever, who looks like you? So part of it too is thinking during informal moments and summer programs, you know, as underrepresented as, as um, freshmen at the, or at, Harvard in the regular class, imagine their summer programs and other opportunities for people to do outreach and come and visit and make those kinds of connections. I think one of the things rural communities really highlight is that relationships matter. That's true in education, uh, generally, broadly. And right now, we're going to have to really fight to get back to the relationships and back to prioritizing informal times because they've been taken away. And and once they've been taken away with COVID, it's gonna be hard to get back to understanding how important things like field trips are or visitors or those pieces. So it's something that we have to be very strategic about if we wanna get back to that place. And it's for certainly if we wanna expand it. Terrific. Um, okay, I was just checking to see there's, um, there's one last question that came in, we'll just do this one too. Could you speak to the economic opportunities for rural communities being the center for the development of renewable energy? Kind of outside the scope, but from your perspective. A great STEM connection there, right? <laughs> if we want to engage our students to try on a different identity as an engineer or something, there's a lot of great things there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of initiatives, um, you know, around, particularly around solar, um, you know, in Eastern Kentucky. Um, you know, it's, it's not, uh, despite what you might see in the press, it's not frowned upon. People are excited about it. It's, it has created jobs, not in any sort of concentrated way. Um, you know, what, what we've ended up doing in our lives here, yes, you know, we, we have these positions at the University of the Cumberlands, which is a great institution. Over half their students are first generation, um, very diverse. It's, you know, look it up. It's, they're doing wonderful things here. Um, we've gotten pulled into economic development. So now we're, we're running our own businesses and employing people. And, you know, that's one of the major things uh, that you do in rural communities is you wear many different hats. Um, and so I think it's going back to why rural matters more than ever. We have to do both at the same time. We have to build, rebuild an economy and educate students for that economy. And it's a very heavy lift. Um, and so that's we, where we found ourselves. Nicole asked what kind of ice cream we have. We, Sky runs a great ice cream uh, general store. We've got a coffee shop. I'm opening up a brewery in Harlan. You know, so this is where we found ourselves. And, and so we're, I guess we, we are kind of this. Uh... Well, you can't, be, you know, in rural, <laughs> in rural communities, you don't have the ability to keep it all separate, right? And I think it's a it's a subtle nuance. It's a difference to think of a job as an educator is to get those kids off to college, and then college will they'll go into that black box and they'll come out with a job, right? In a rural community, you have to think, well, what what does our community need? And sometimes, frankly, it's how is our community going to survive? And it's very different to teach children so that they can be the ones to transform their community and to make sure that it survives. But dang, is it exciting, right? I mean, we might have some people on here who teach in places like 
you know, the Navajo Nation. We're going to mean, that's the kind of work that's the true art and beauty of education and why so many of us are passionate about it and why we got into it. And so again, thinking that rural communities could be on the forefront. Well, if we think of education as a, a pathway to build the communities we want, what a beautiful thing that we could be the test case for as our country goes forward and thinks about the kind of lives we want to have and the kind of, if we don't want everything to come from Amazon and we don't want it to be these big monopolies, how can we create that? Well, let's start with our schools. You know, we've got those great teachers and we could probably make it happen. So I'm mindful of time, we're approaching one. So I'm gonna um, thank you both. I'm gonna hand things over to Diane for any closing remarks. Thank you. That was a, a really important discussion. Um, so yeah, again, I apologize for, on behalf of Zoom, <laughs> I'm still not sure what happened, but uh, I've contacted our IT department and um, we'll post a recording. It will probably be two separate recordings. Uh, you'll get all the information. Everyone who um, signed up for this event will get this information via email tomorrow. Um, and again, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I hope to do this in person one day. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Great. Yeah, this was great. Thank you for inviting us. We really appreciate all the work that you all do to, to address and, and bring up these important issues. So we can't thank Harvard, Harvard Ed Press, uh, 